and we're live. Welcome back to Prophecy 3 DNA, where we discover, decrypt, and demystify Bible prophecy and apply it. My name is Donnie Alvarenga, and this is my brother, Don DeCuna, and we are honored to be facilitating this study of the Bible. We believe that the Bible not only tells us what happened, but it's also, it's like kind of like the, the, um, uh, the story and the code book, right? All in one. And we believe that it can um, interpret itself. I'm having a hard time finding my words today. And last time we met, we talked about a religious political power that got established and that there were certain things that happened, including persecution. We also talked about some specific dates and we also made a claim of who we thought that religious polit political power was. So today we're going to take a trip down memory lane, if you will. We're going to go through history to compare what, what is it that happened on these specific dates that we made claims about. And um, is it what we think it is um, that the Bible is saying? So we invite you to everything that we say. We invite you to go and research your own Bible and um, research history and look at everything yourself. Um, but we're just guiding you through this through this um, study. Is there anything you would like to add to that, Don? No, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> add some stuff here after we pray. So would you mind praying to start us out? Okay. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us some insight into what was going to happen in the future and in the past. And I pray that your Holy Spirit um, join us now as we study your word so that we can understand what you intended to say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right. There's our methodology, and we will go right into it. So we had this diagram here where we covered different prophetic time periods. And just as a quick recap, there was the 1335 prophetic day prophecy, okay, that led us to discovering a start date of 508 AD. And this start date pinpointed a time period when this religio-political union would be established with a um, <clears throat> the ability to persecute. Meaning, for example, like, um, I can empower you through military means. Does that make sense? So, for example, like if a church or a religious organization, they don't have a military power, right? They're just preaching and teaching and doing their rituals or whatever. So for them to enforce any of their beliefs, what do they need? Political power. They need political power, but specifically what part of the political power? Like military power? Military, police, that kind of stuff, right? Law enforcement. Law enforcement. An enforcement mechanism of the political wing, okay? So in the prophecy we read in Daniel, it described how an army was going to be given to this power, okay? That happened in 508 AD. That's what this 1503 prophecy points us to, okay? Then there was the 29, uh, 1290 prophecy that describes this is what's called when the abomination of desolation would manifest, as in there would be something that would lead to the desolation of this power. Okay? So this power had been doing so much of two things, all right? So remember when we were studying Thyatira, what were the two things that Thyatira was doing? What was Jezebel doing in Thyatira? Um, I don't remember exactly what you're talking about. Okay, so Jezebel was teaching God's people to do what? Eat foods, sacrifice, sacrifice to idols, mm -hmm. which is persecution, correct? <clears throat> and it was fornicating which means courting or getting in bed with the government. 
Does that make sense? Right. All right. So because of the getting in bed with the government inevitably leads to persecution. There you have the fornication leading up to the eating the food sacrificed to idols. Does that make sense? Right. All right. So here we have the beginning of the fornication. And because of the beginnings of the fornication, throughout this period here, you develop eating food sacrificed to idols. Does that make sense? Right. But because of all of the idol worship and the, the amount of bodies and bloodshed that are caused, <clears throat> God has to put a stop to it. Does that make sense? So right. there will be a desolation because of the abominations that are done. Mm -hmm. All right. So this prophecy describes when that happens. The end point. And that is in 1798. Then you have the 1260 year prophecy that describes the time period of the actual persecution. From if this is when it ends, we need to know when do the persecutions actually start. And so here is the persecution. So right here is when the friendship is made. Right here is the catalyst to now say, okay, you have all the power, you have all the military enforcement, you have all the political power, and now proceed to do all the damage you're going to do. <clears throat> but the prophecy also tells us that from here, you proceed no further. Okay. That was just the recap. We need to prove from history that this is the case now. Because that's the historical flow method. That is historical historicism. Is this true? Did this actually happen? Because we made a claim that the papacy and the European powers is this entity. The papacy mm -hmm. is the religious wing. The European powers during this time period, in union with the papacy, is that sea beast. The papacy itself is the little horn on the beast's head. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. All right. For example, the papacy would be Jezebel. The Ahab would be the European powers. So, for example, Jezebel is the one teaching God's people to eat the food and fornicate. But she's fornicating with the kings. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now we have to see, is that the case? So first, we're going to start with the 508. And to do that, we're going to learn about this gentleman here named Clovis. Can you read that or is it too small? No. Okay, so I'll go ahead and read it. <laughs> Clovis the first, all right? Clovis the first was the first king of the Franks and united all the Frankish tribes under one ruler. He is considered to have been the founder of the Merovingian dynasty who ruled the Frankish kingdom for the next two centuries. Clovis is, an import, is important in the history, historiography of France as the first king of what would become France. So remember, this is pre-idea of nations. So Europe at this point still weren't nations. They were still tribes. All right, so when the, when, um, when Rome collapsed, you still had the concept of city-states. 
It wasn't nation states, it was city states. So for example, the Roman Empire was a Rome itself was only a city. It wasn't you can't think of it as like this the country of Italy. Because Italy as a country did not exist. Another example, Babylon. The empire of Babylon was a representation of the city of Babylon. Does that make sense? So city states versus nation states. All right. So what's being described here about Clovis is that he is what would become France. He is a precursor to the idea of a nation state, but he is going to establish what would become the nation state. Okay, you can even know because the name France comes from the Franks. Okay, let's learn a little bit more, more about him. Clovis is also significant because of his conversion to Nicene Christianity. We're going to learn, we're going to refresh about Nicene Christianity. <clears throat> Do you remember... The Nicene Creed. We talked about this uh, when we were talking about Pergamum. we talked about it. Okay. We're going to do a refresher on it here, okay, in our, in our study. But there were primarily two big branches of Christianity, Arianism and Nicene Christianity. Long story short, Nicene Christianity won out as the predominant Christian view of the entirety of the Western and Eastern Roman empires. So basically the Christian world. Okay. And um, the tenets of Nicene Christianity become the rule of the land, as we will we'll see. Clovis was baptized on Christmas Day in 508... AD. What is the significance of this? The adoption of Clovis to Nicene Christianity was opposed to the Arianism of most other Germanic tribes and led to widespread conversion among the Frankish peoples, to religious unification across what is now modern-day France, the Low Countries, and Germany. Three centuries later, to Charlemagne's alliance with the Bishop of Rome. And in the middle of the 10th century, under the Otto the Great, Otto I the Great, to the, con the consequent birth of the Holy Roman Empire. So what is this saying here? Clovis was the first amongst a long list of, of European um, leaders to religiously unify with who? The Bishop of Rome. <clears throat> okay? Keep reading. Go back here. You want me to... Clovis was born pagan, sorry. Clovis was born pagan, but later became interested in converting to Arian Christianity. Okay? So he became an Arian, not a Nicene. Okay? So Arians basically believed that Jesus was God's son, but he was a created being. Okay, he is not co-substantial with God, meaning he is not God in, um, in and of himself also. All right. Clovis's wife, Cotilde, a Burgundian princess, was a Nicene Christian, despite the Arianism that surrounded her at court. Her persistence eventually persuaded Co uh, Clovis to convert to Nicene Christianity, which he initially resisted. Clovis eventually converted to Nicene Christianity following the battle, the battle of Tobiac on Christmas Day, 508 AD. 
The king's Nicene baptism was of immense importance to the subsequent history of Western and Central Europe in general, as Clovis expanded his dominion over almost all of Gaul. Nicene Christianity offered certain advantages to Clovis as he fought to distinguish his rule among competing powers, power centers in Western Europe. So was his motivation strictly because he believed in the tenets of Nicene Christianity? <clears throat> what were they? Political. They were also political. He had political motivations for doing so. Okay? His conversion to Nicene forms of Christianity served to set him apart from other Germanic kings of his time. His embrace of the Nicene faith may have also gained him support of the Nicene Christ Christian Gallo-Roman aristocracy in his later campaigns against the Visigoths, which drove them from, the southern, from <coughs> southern Gaul in 507 and resulted in a great many of his people converting to Christianity as well. Okay? So not only did it help him politically distinguish himself from peer kingdoms, but who did it buy him favor with? I'm sorry, I coughed, I think, when you were talking about that. Well, let's skip all that right here in blue. The aristocracy, a specific group of people that are very wealthy. Influential. Influential. Okay. And what did his conversion ultimately do? So, for example, if the king converts, what happens to the people? Well, we don't live in a monarchy, but I'm assuming that the king kind of sets the pace. So there was a, a saying when I was in the military that whatever my boss, whatever piques the interest of my boss fascinates the heck out of me. Okay? So you can think in a feudalist society, typically feudalist, as you can think <laughs> back in the days of this, this is happening. Whatever the king is interested in, Guess what happens to his peasants? Okay. They're doing it. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They're doing it. So now, let's go to here again. And let's find out what the end result of all of this interest in Clovis does. To the French people, he is the founder of France. Clovis did bequeath to his heirs the support of both uh, people and the church, such that when the magnates were ready to do away with the royal house, the sanction of the pope was sought first. So who does he set up in preeminence even to his own power? The pope. The pope. Okay. Okay. So let's put it this way. If you as a royal body, okay, you being a king, and now if you're going to dissolve a royal estate, okay, your, your royal thing, before you do that, you have to go check with the Pope. Who is the de facto boss? The Pope. The Pope is. Because as a king, you should be able to decide because it's your country. But now if you have to go talk to somebody else and say, can I do this? Who have you given your power to? The other one. <clears throat> so he set up a precedent that started in 508 AD. Okay. By his conversion to Christianity, he made himself the ally of the papacy and its protector, as well as that of the people who were mostly Catholic. So, for example, one of the things that he did do 
is he told the Bishop of Rome, I will give you my army to protect your peoples as they are going through the lands. So he, you know, I will be the guardian of the faith. So before this, <laughs> did the papacy have access to an army? No. No. Before this, did the Pope have, you know, could they tell kings what they could or couldn't do? Mm -mm. No. But when did this begin? With Clovis. With Clovis, what date? 508. 508 AD. What did the prophecy in 508 AD say? There would be emerging. There would be a merging, and there would be an army given to this power. Okay, now let's go to the next one. 538 AD, and for this, I think this article I found was probably one of the best ones to describe this, because this is not a religious source. International Journal for <laughs> Humanities and Social Sciences is it actually just a secular uh, educational academic journal, okay? And the writers of this article are not theologians. Some are, but in vast portions of it, they're studiers of the humanities and they're anthropologists and they are historians, okay? This is what their assessment is, taking biblical prophecies in their assessments on the significance of 538 AD, okay? And so here it says, 538 AD, and the transition from pagan Roman Empire to the Holy Roman Empire. Justinian's metamorphosis from chief of staff to theologian. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to focus on what's going on in the Eastern Roman Empire, because right now, that's the last true emperor of the Roman Empire. Okay, because the Western <laughs> Roman Empire collapsed in 476 AD. Okay, but the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantines, they're still kicking right? So you can think of people like Constantine, right? He was the Eastern Roman Empire, or Emperor, sorry. But now you get a guy named Justinian, all right? Justinian was very, very theologically inclined, as we're going to find out here, all right? So let's see what these professors and academics and researchers have to say. Can you read that, or is it too small? All right, I'll go ahead and read it. <clears throat> the year 538 AD became the turning point in history of the Roman Empire since so many aspects of the political, administrative, and economic levels were already switched off that when Justinian declared himself to be a theologian from this year and no longer a soldier, he crossed the barrier of his mandate between what is purely civil obligation and what is a religious obligation. Similarly to Constantine before, and entered in competition with the papal function, and this role is evidence of Justinian's ongoing Cesaro papism. Okay, so what is a very academic way of saying this? Justinian was an emperor, but in 538 AD, he took a very radical swing in saying, I'm no longer just going to be, because as, as, a, as a Caesar, right, as an emperor, you are a soldier. You lead the army. But he's like, <laughs> I don't want to lead armies anymore. I want to lead the church. And it, he did something called 
Cesaro papi papism. Okay? So, Cesaro state papism church. What was the date? 538. 538. The quest for unification of the empire by unification of the church. Unification of the state by what means? Unification of the church. Church and state union. All right. The fever for church building projects with his wife, Theodora, the persecution of enemies of the church and heretics. So when does the persecution actually start? 538 AD. Okay. So, so what is he doing By in 538 AD? Heretics. What was that? By labeling people heretics. Okay, well, we'll we're, we're getting all of that. But what is the catalyst date? 538. 538. So we're getting all these things. The persecution of enemies of the church and heretics. His disdain for the Sabbath. Oh, wait, oh, where did I go? Uh, yeah, okay. The persecution of the enemies of the church and heretics. His disdain with the Sabbath. Although his second name was Sabatini. His support for suppressing any eschatol eschatological fervor in line with the church fathers and Ocumenus. Okay, so what is it saying here? His support for suppressing any eschatological fervor or fever, meaning this, he didn't want anybody to understand prophecy, because eschatology means end time events. So he was willing <laughs> to suppress any understanding of prophecy. Okay? In line with the church fathers and Ocumenus. So who else was not interested in people understanding prophecy? The church fathers. The church fathers. So here you have the state leader and the church father saying, I don't want you to understand prophecy. Does that make sense? <clears throat> okay. And yet trying to build the kingdom of God on earth. All this indicates the problem of 538 AD was for the Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. The Code of Justinian was a persecuting instrument. So the Code of Justinian was just his, we're going to read a lot about it. But the Code of Justinian was basically a um, previous emperors had made a bunch of laws, but there was never a consolidated document that had put all these laws into one um, form. So what he did, he's like, well, look in that book, that book, that book, that book for all these other emperor's laws. I'm going to vet through them. And the ones I'm interested, I'm going to keep. The ones I'm not interested, I'm going to scrap. And then it's all going to be in this one book. And then these are the laws that are going to be the laws of the empire. And that way we don't have all these disparate laws all over the place. Okay. So the Code of Justinian was a persecuting instrument. And we're going to read some of these laws verbatim out of the Code of Justinian. Justinian upheld the supremacy of the papacy. He permitted through the Council of <laughs> Orleans actions to be done on Sunday that Constantine prohibited like travel and preparation of food and cleaning, of ho cleaning the house. In novella, I'm not going to read all that. Um, Constantine, Pro oh, oh, hold on. Uh, I, I keep losing my space because it's small on my screen too. So Justinian instituted a seventh day Sabbath persecution. 
He changed the times and laws ad hoc as his novelle whatever coins of 538 AD indicates. Private gatherings were persecuted. He had church manual laws. Justinian studied systematic theology on the nature of Christ and ho wrote homiletic rules for preachers. So now you have the... Um, the leader of the political <laughs> world writing a prescriptive way for preachers to preach. Right. Okay. <laughs> he gave text critical advice to Jews and condemned their doctrinal deviations. This theological hobby of the ruler of the once mighty Roman Empire was to be taken over by more theological competent power that would eventually lead to papal Caesarism, or Caesarism, until the unsettling of his aggrandizing paradigm in 1798 by Napoleon. So they're saying here, the things that Justinian began doing in 1798 were continued by subsequent people until Napoleon put a stop to it in 1798. Okay? And what did these, what do these um, academics call it? Papal Caesarism. Church and state. A union of church and state. Now they're going to get into the biblical components of it. The prophetic embedding of the 1260 days as years prophecies in both Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 definitively started in 538 AD, contrary to W. Spicer's 1918 suggestion of 533 or 538 as two alternative dates of any other dates suggested by scholars in the history of interpretation in historicism. It is also not just a case of history interpretation hermeneutics, but data solidly supported by archaeology, iconography, and original historical sources that coincide with the parameters provided by exegesis of the rest of the books of Daniel and Revelation added with the exegesis of the detail of the passages under this consideration. So these people that are not necessarily, they're not pushing an agenda here. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. this is a secular source they're writing into. They're just saying, hey, in accordance with archaeology, iconography, and history, Daniel and Revelation describe this without question. Now, that, that begs a huge question. Because Daniel talked about this in the 6th century BC. And John <laughs> wrote this from prison on or about 90 AD. Okay? Just for your consideration. All right. A necessary ingredient for historical researchers remain to be the faith that God can predict the future. And he did. And that the data has we and that the data as well as the prophecies of the biblical text are evidence of that. Okay? So these folks here are like, look, it is a huge predictor of the future. You can ignore it to your peril. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So what else happened in 538 AD? Let's talk more about Justinian. Justinian saw the orthodoxy of his empire threatened by diverging religious currents. 
Let me see if I can zoom in more because it is kind of small, even on my screen. Okay. All right. Justinian saw the orthodoxy of his empire threatened by diverging religious currents and had been a source of tension in the relationship with the Bishop of Rome. Justinian, who continued this policy, tried to impose religious unity on his subjects by forcing them to accept doctrinal compromises that might appeal to all parties, a policy that proved unsuccessful as he satisfied none of them. So his first concept was like, look, just, you know, kumbaya with each other by picking and choosing different things from different people. Does that make sense? Yeah. But did that make anybody happy? No. Nope. No. Because then now I'm like, well, I don't want to accept that. I don't want to accept this. Right? In the course of his reign, Justinian, who had a genuine interest in matter of theologies, authored a small number of theolo theological treaties. As, his, as in his secular administration, despotism appeared also in the emperor's ecclesiastical po policy. So he's like, he was a despot in politics. Why would he not be a despot in church issues? All right. He regulated everything in religion and law. He deemed it proper to promulgate by law the church's belief in the Trinity and the Incarnation and to threaten all heretics with the appropriate penalties. Whereas he subsequently declared that he intended to deprive all disturbers of orthodoxy of the opportunity for such offenses by due process of the law. Okay? So who is and <clears throat> who is a heretic by his definition? The ones that don't follow his rules. <laughs> All disturbers of orthodoxy. So here is the orthodoxy that I define. And if you disturb that, you are therefore a heretic. That is the definition of heretic in accordance with the state that is making laws now to defend the church. But who do you think is giving the state these ideas? Okay. The church. It's, 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 a, it's a mutual thing. So, for example, when we saw Clovis... Were there benefits for him to be in bed with the state or with the yes. church? With the church? Yes. Yes. Do you think there's benefits for the church to be in bed with the state? As we're going to see here in a minute with Justinian. Watch. Yes. He made the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed the sole symbol of the church and accorded legal force to the canons of the four ecumenical councils. The bishops in attendance at the Council of Constantinople recognized that nothing could be done in the church contrary to the emperor's will and command. Justinian protected the purity of the church by suppressing heretics. He neglected no opportunity to secure the rights of the church and the clergy and to protect the extended monasticism. He granted the monks the right to inherit property from private citizens and the right to receive solemnia and annual or annual grifts from the imperial treasury or from the taxes of certain provinces, and he lay prohibited, oh, and he prohibited lay confiscation of monastic estates. So now what, what do you see here? as the benefit of the church. Well, they're getting lots of special perks. Money. Mm -hmm. Correct. So they receive. Uh, <clears throat> what is it called? Land. <laughs> they receive land from private citizens. 
Who are the private citizens do you think they're receiving the land from? The people that were called heretics. The people that were called heretics. So do you think there might be incentive in some cases to call people heretics? Yep. All right. In the Bible, there is a story about Naboth's vineyard in the Jezebel and Ahab narrative. I would recommend you take a look at it because Naboth was declared to be a heretic so the king could take his land, right? Anyways, just to show the typologies of the Bible still apply even in what's happening here, right? Not only that, but taxes are going to the church. All right. He was a nursing father of the church. Both the Codex and the Novelle contain many enactments regarding donations, foundations, and the administration of ecclesiastical property, elections, rights of the bishops and priests and abbots, monastic life, residential obligations of the clergy, conduct of the divine service, Episcopal jurisdiction. Justinian also rebuilt the Church of Hagia Sophia, which cost 20,000 pounds of gold. All right. So now let's go back. Now, also in 538 AD, there's a very interesting thing that happened. Justinian knew that Rome had been taken over by Gothic kings that were Arian. Justinian was Nicene. Do you think he could stand for that? Mm -mm. No. In fact, the Pope of Rome was an Arian. Do you think that's acceptable? No. Absolutely not. So he sent one of his generals named Belisarius to go and take Rome back for Nicene Christianity. So we're going to read here about the Siege of Rome. So from March 337 to March 538, Belisarius... 337 or 537? 538, sorry. It says it March 537 <laughs> to March 538, Belisarius, who is Justinian's um, uh, general, successfully defended Rome. The siege lasted from 537 to March 538. Now we're going to read here something very interesting. During the siege of Rome, an incident occurred which the general will long be condemned. Belisarius, a Byzantine Rite Christian, was commanded by the monophyte Christian Empress Theodora, who was Justinian's wife, to depose the reigning pope who was installed by the Goths. This pope was the former subdeacon Silverius, the son of Pope Homicides. So one of the things you need to understand is back then, the, the papacy and, and the Catholic Church in general, they didn't have the same rules of celibacy and, and not marrying like they do now. They've changed the rules of the game with time. But here you actually see that there was, and, and throughout many years in the papacy, there was an issue with nepotism, okay? In the sense that they were, there were actually some points where the papacy was trying to make it where it was hereditary, like kings, right? So like a king would pass on the, the reign to his child. Some popes were trying to do that with their children, 
All right. And so obviously that did not go well. <laughs> People did not like that. But this is one of those cases. Okay. So this pope was the former subdeacon Silverius, the son of Pope Homocetus. So here you have a back to back father son pope situation. But Silverius was an Arian, as was his father who preceded him. Question here, though, is, was this pope elected or was he put in place by a Gothic king? He was put in place by a Gothic king, right here. Silverius had been put there by a Gothic king that preceded him. Okay, this king is like, you will be the Bishop of Rome. He wasn't voted by his peers. He was installed by a Gothic king. So who gave the Pope his seat? The king. A political power. Okay, it wasn't the religious body that gave him his seat. It was the political power that gave him his seat. Very important. Next. Belisarius was to replace him with the deacon Vigilius. I'm not going to say this. Uh, Apoc Apocrisarius of Pope John II in Constantinople. So now what they're going to do is say, I'm going to take one of my Byzantine Nicene bishops and I'm going to ship him over to Rome and he's going to be your new pope. Okay? Because he's Nicene. He's my guy. All right? Vigilius had in fact been chosen in 538 by Pope Boniface II to be his successor, but this choice was strongly criticized by the Roman clergy and Boniface eventually reversed his decision. So the Roman clergy didn't want a somebody from Constantinople to be their pope. Why? Why do you think that's the case? They didn't have influence there. They didn't, they didn't have influence there. And not only that, but if somebody comes from Constantine, who's going to be all the influence? Justinian. And they knew that. So they're like, well, if whoever comes from, from Constantinople, they're just going to have the emperor's ear and the emperor's going to have his ear. And they're just, it's going to be this self-licking -lick, ice cream cone. And we that actually run things, we don't want that to happen. All right. Silverius was accused of conspiring with the Gothic kings and several Roman senators to secretly open the gates of the city. Belisarius had him stripped of his vestments and exiled to Patara Pat 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 in Lycia in Asia Minor. Vigilius had already been installed in his place. So now here's the other point. Vigilius who is the new pope, who put him there? Another political power. Another political power. Were these elected men from within the body of the church? No. No. <clears throat> it was a political entity that put him on his seat. All right. Silverius was intercepted before he could reach Rome and exiled once more, this time to the island of Palmarola, Ponza, where at one account he said to, to have starved to death, while others say he uh, left for Constantinople. So here, something I want you to kind of key in on. There is a pope who was exiled. At the start of the persecutory period, there is a pope who goes into exile and the state puts another pope in power. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What I'm telling you now is that ever since 538 AD, 
every subsequent pope, regardless of them being voted in or not by their peers, who gave them that seat to begin with? A political power. A political power. It was always a political power that even gave them the seat to begin with. It was never the church that gave them the seat. It was a political entity that said, here you go. Does that make sense? All right. So now let's go to back here. Skip all these. Yep, skip that. Oh, already read that. Now, let's read this. For the first 300 years within the Roman Empire, oh, sorry, it's been cut off. For the first 300 years within the Roman Empire, the church was persecuted and unrecognized, unable to hold and transfer property. The system began to change under the reign of Emperor Constantine the Great, who made Christianity lawful within the Roman Empire and restored it to any properties that had been confiscated. In the larger cities of the empire, this would have been considerable, and the Roman patrimony not least among them, the Lateran Palace was the first significant new donations to the church, most pro probably a gift from Constantine himself. So that's, again, Constantine. This we talked about during the Pergamum phase, correct? How this started <clears throat> the friendship between church and state, right? The, 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 the church was brought up from a persecuted church and elevated to a, a place of prominence. Okay. Right. Other donations followed primarily in the mainland of Italy, but also in the province of the Roman Empire. However, the church held all these lands as private landowners, not as a sovereign entity. I'm keying this in. They were not a sovereign entity. They were a private landowner. Okay. Sovereign entity means nobody can take it from you. But as a private landowner, somebody else, like the state, for example, can just come in and take it. As central Roman authority disintegrated throughout the late 5th century, control over the Italian, Italian peninsula repeatedly changed hands, falling under Arian suzerainty during the reign of Od Odoacer and later the Ostrogoths. Okay, so when we were talking there about the Gothic kings that had their pope in place that eventually lost in Rome in 538 AD, those were the Ostrogoths. Okay? The church organization in Italy, with the pope at its head, submitted to necessity to the sovereign authority while asserting its spiritual supremacy over the whole church. So here it's describing how the pope said, yes, I acknowledge the sovereignty of the emperor, but we are the spiritual emperors of the church. All right? <clears throat> the seeds of the papal states as a sovereign political entity were planted in the 6th century. Beginning in 535 under Emperor Justinian I, the Eastern, Eastern Roman Empire referred to by most historians as the Byzantine Empire, launched the Gothic War to reconquer Italy. With effective Byzantine power at the northeastern end of this territory, the Pope, as the largest landowner and most prestigious figure in Italy, began, by default, to take on much of the ruling authority by that the Byzantines were unable to exercise in the areas surrounding the city of Rome. So what, what happened when um, Belisarius left Rome in the hands of Vigilius, the new pope? 
the Byzantines didn't have a, a political entity to give control of Rome over to. So who here is being described as the, the ruling authority in all of Rome now? The Pope. The Pope. He's like, okay, well, I got tag, you're it. Okay? While the popes remain, uh, <laughs> legally remain Roman, Roman subjects under Byzantine authority in practice, the Duchy of Rome, an area roughly equivalent to Lazio, became an independent state ruled by the Pope. When did this happen? 538 AD. The Church's independence, aided by popular support for the papacy in Italy, enabled various popes to defy the will of the Byzantine emperor. So eventually, now the church even became a sovereignty in and of itself. Pope Gregory, Gregory II even excommunicated Emperor Leo III during the iconoclastic controversy. Nevertheless, the pope and the exarch still worked together. As Byzantine power weakened, though, the papacy assumed even larger role in protecting Rome. Okay, so going back here. That is 538 AD. The beginnings of the papacy now becoming not just a religious entity in and of itself, but a political entity in and of itself. Because the Arian Pope went into exile, and then a new state-sanctioned Pope got put in his seat. So now, as we wrap up, let's see what happened in 1798. Do you think that it might be a good idea for us to maybe start 1798 next time? Yeah, I guess we can. Yeah, we can do that. So we did the first half. We did the first half, okay? We talked about how this religious political religio-political power in Europe began. Okay? What did you get out of it? Well, um it's like this game of cat and mouse, if you will. It's like the political power gave power to the religious power by putting popes in place and giving it kind of a political effort but then it kind of swung where the religious powder power then started having even power over the political power in that it like excommunicated emperors and so forth and so it kind of like it was like the swing of power where it was kind of like really fluid but at the same time it seems like the religious power seemed to keep getting more power correct so this is the moment, again, so if we see the chiastic point, it describes where blasphemies are now happening, right? In the sense of... I have the power. People assuming the prerogatives of God, where they are now in a not only a rulership capacity, but a religious capacity. And they can um, let's put it this way. They can dispense mercy on God's behalf, but they can also dispense punishments on God's behalf. We see Justinian taking a very strong stance on punishing the unorthodox, defining them as heretics. All right, we didn't get into, in the interest of time, reading every single one of these Justinian code things, which I actually might touch on at the very beginning of the next one. I think it's valuable, okay? I think it's valuable. But also we see that the, the popes that were installed in Rome were installed by political entities, all right? There's this claim to be this long succession of 
you know, from Peter. Does that make sense? Oh, mm -hmm. we, we're long succession all the way back to Peter. No. Clearly not. Because before you was an Arian. That Arian Christianity doesn't even exist anymore. And then in 538, a Nicene Christian, so what you can think of as Catholicism, uh, a Byzantine emperor puts you there. So it was actually a political entity that established your rule where you are now. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't this continually long chain all the way back to Peter. Didn't exist. There was at least a, for a while there, there was a gap of a couple hundred years. Because the, the, the Rome itself was run by Arians for a couple of hundred years. Right? And Catholicism is not Arian. Period. So the popes of today that exist today are from that line. From the ones that started in 538. Their seat was given to them by political leaders, period, without question, right? Is there anything else you got out of today's study? Well, that, you know, in this whole transfer of power, you know, there's just been a, an attempt to take power away from God, you know, attributing the power to him, but really taking it away. And obviously we can't take God's power away, but that's what you were touching on in terms of the blasphemy, but it's all a power trip. It's all a power trip. And the key point, I believe, is that, like you mentioned in the beginning, a religious power, like you need to have some kind of law enforcement structure, law enforcement body, right? For you to really have power. And that was given to the religious powers. And once again, it became like this power trip where little by little, power was being taken away from what God says. And so the question is for us today, who has the power? Who who do you give authority to in your life, in the things that you do and the choices that you make? Um, and the choices that you make, are they coming really from God's power or God's sayings or God's laws or from man-made ones? Yeah, awesome. All right, I'll go ahead and pray to close this out. Dear Father, thank you for opening our eyes and opening our ears and opening our hearts, Father, to, to this study that we've gone through today. We know that it may be painful for some um, uh, to actually see these things that, that are, are brought out from history and from uh, this study that we've done. But Father, we pray that um, you can touch our hearts to, to truly understand what you want us to know. And to know, Father, that you revealed this to us so long ago so that we are not caught unawares for other things you are going to reveal or that you have revealed to us for the future. Please be with all those who are watching and listening to this and that they may go back into your word and dig deeper and deeper and to have a stronger relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.